Hi everyone, it's Felicia here to read chapter 19 of Unnaturally Green. I've just woken up from a nap, but I think it will contribute to a nice deep voice, which will make reading it all the more soothing for you and me. So we're going to pick up in chapter 19. I'm going to be reading it off my computer, so I apologize for any glitches, technologically or otherwise. Chapter 19, Saying Goodbye. The countdown to closing began. After my grandmother's funeral, I slowly began to mop myself off the floor. Instead of dwelling in sadness, I tried to approach the final months with optimism, working to table my feelings of guilt or needling dread about what the heck I was going to do come September. In June, Eden, the idol and mentor, announced she would bid the cast farewell and that a to-be-determined replacement actress would fill in through September. In the face of this news, it occurred to me that I hadn't, as planned, becomes, e become Eden's loyal protege. It had been trickier than I thought for a standby to get to know her principal actor, let alone kiss her ring and lounge with her in togas on large rocks, but that was the nature of it. Eden always worked when I didn't, and vice versa. Determined to do something about it, I emailed Eden and asked her to meet me for lunch. A couple of days later, and there we sat, an alphaba and her standby, at a table in an outdoor garden tying up loose ends over chicken curry. This place is great, Eden said, as she took a bite from her sandwich, her green nails standing out against the white ciabatta bread. Thanks for meeting me, again, I said, talking like there was dust in my mouth. Although I'd known her for a few months now, I still felt like a stammering theater geek. No problem, Felicia. My pleasure. With permission to proceed, I sprung into action, asking Eden about her vocal health rituals, what it had been like standing by for Idina Menzel or originating the title role in Brooklyn, the burning questions I would never have the chance to ask again. And how about your Wicked audition, I asked. What did you do to prepare? Eden told me she'd been coached by Stephanie J. Block, a former Alphaba who played the role in Wicked's first workshop. And man, she said, am I glad I had Stephanie. I could not act at all back then. You've got to be joking, I replied. You? Everybody knew that one of the reasons Eden was such a phenomenal Alphaba was not just because of her voice, but because of her captivating acting. No, seriously, I had no idea what I was doing. Singing, I could do. But acting, I had to work at it really hard. As we laughed together, I felt myself growing more comfortable. It was so easy to talk to Eden. She was frank and honest, and as she reminisced, she leaned her head back, looking up at the trees. And I remember, she said, I had to go on the night after Adina won the Tony. <laughs> she laughed to herself and shook her head. Talk about having to win over a disappointed crowd. Eden, like me, had been a standby. I loved this fact. While it was years in her past, she had at one point known what it felt like to be in limbo with the burden of having to prove herself time and again. Being standby, being standby had first bonded me to Libby. Now, I realized, it also bonded me to Eden. At lunch, we lamented our strange alphabet fate of always looking slightly off color and never quite being able to wash away all the green. Soon, we were two girls gabbing away about mishaps, relationships, her life in L.A., and what it had been like having to do long distance with her soon-to-be husband. As she saw it, they would make anything work. Joseph, she said, was the first man who took precedence over work. That was huge for me. I told Eden about my own adventure with Marshall, how what had begun as a romantic comedy premise lately evolved into something much more real and lasting in that scary, life-changing way. When you know, you just know, she said, smiling. Not to kill the tender mood or anything, but I pulled out my Blackberry and showed her a picture of Marshall, shirtless. Girl, she said laughing, you've got to keep this one, if only for his abs. Since first trailing Eden, I had known her to be a generous spirit. At lunch, I was reminded of this once again. Despite her fame, she took extra care to stop and take notice of others. To be there for somebody like me. Somebody green. But I suppose, at the end of the day... We had that in common. Eden's complexion was light like mine, tinted ever so slightly from remnants of makeup. She wore a crocheted hat over her rich black hair, which hung in waves down below her shoulders, an accessory that was as stylish as it was practical. 
Whatever hides the green, she said, smirking. This reminded me of one last topic. Should I bring it up? It was an anecdote from my past that I'd nearly forgotten, but I had a hunch Eden would understand. I, I haven't told anybody this, I said as I furrowed my brow. But one time, this director randomly paused rehearsal and told me I needed to look better, like, prettier. Actually, his exact words were, you know, you could look really pretty if you just tried. What, was he nuts? I laid down the facts. I mean, I always look nice for auditions and stuff, I said, but sometimes at rehearsals, I don't know, it's just not me. I always look perfect. Have you ever felt that the business puts pressure on you? You're preaching to the choir, Eden said as she leaned in. Okay, on the one hand, I get it. This is a looks-based business. But, it's, but at the same time, it's like, a girl can only do so much. She took off her crocheted hat and ran her fingers along her hairline. I mean, look at this. I feel your pain, I said, in green girl solidarity. There are some people, she said, who are always going to look perfect. They're going to come out of the stage door looking totally fabulous, like Shoshana. After her shows, she would appear in full makeup and dark glasses looking totally fierce. Me? I don't have the energy. She paused and looked me in the eye. You just have to be yourself. After the last shred of chicken curry disappeared from our plates, we paid the check, hugged, and parted ways down the sidewalk. As I walked, I felt a spring in my step. I just had lunch with Eden Espinosa. The twelve-year-old me would not have believed me if I told her. Rounding the corner, I realized it was obvious. The reason Eden was so astounding was not because of dressing room rituals, resume credits, or hundreds of thousands of fans. It was because she was so very human. All around, Wicked's tectonic plates were shifting. On the same day Eden was scheduled to leave, Kendra, our Glinda, and French Nick would also bid the cast farewell. Kendra to perform in a new L.A. show, and Nick to star as Bert in the touring company of Mary Poppins. Marshall and I were thrilled for him, but as the most enduringly peppy, fearsome foursome member whose energy level rivaled even that of his mop-like dog, that was a tongue twister, Nick would sorely be missed. To ring in his last few days, the fearsome foursome met on Monday for one last workout session, during which there was much trotting, the girls, homoerotic grunting, the boys, and wistful reminiscing, everybody. I don't know what I'll do with a new Fiero, I said to Nick. How will any of us cope, said Marshall, who was definitely more upset than I was.